Well, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's nice to see a little crowd here today. Uh, we have Dr. Nusgoda to talk about EDSD, um, specifically transforming future patterns into useful data. Um, we welcome Dr. Steve Nusgoda today. He's an associate professor in the departments of material science and engineering and mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering department. Uh, Dr. Nusgoda obtained his PhD from Drexel in 2010, where he focused his research on microstructure sensitive design and then postdoc at Los Alamos National Labs before joining us at OSU, uh, where he's currently the leader in the micro and mesoscale mechanics and structure laboratories. Uh, his research interests include micromechanical modeling and simulation, constitutive model development, crystal plasticity, and computational material design tools. Um, it might be interesting to some to know that prior to his engineering studies, Dr. Ginsgoda worked as an industrial machinist and also as a FAA certified aircraft mechanic. I'm very pleased to have Dr. Nizuda today uh, to discuss CBSD. Hi, so thanks everybody. Notice that the word microscopist did not actually come up in any of that. Um, um, I'm a, uh, a computational material scientist who uses um, microscopy data. And I'm actually, one of the areas um, that we use a lot is EBSD data. So I've ended up doing a fair amount of work over the years and trying to understand um, what uh, EBSD can tell us about our materials. Um, and so I'm actually taking this topic and the, the name of the series is Beyond the Scope, very literally. I'm actually not talking about uh, microscopy hardware or EBSD hardware or cameras or sensors. Um, this is really kind of more focused on a historical perspective and the data and throwing out some challenges as to, to what we, uh, what we want to do next. Um, so there are a lot of people who have presentations and papers and books and conference things and posters. Um, Joe Michael, who recently uh, retired from Sandia National Lab, who uh, did the earliest work on phase identification using EBSD. Stuart Wright, who, uh, whose PhD thesis was the first successful automated EBSD or OIM uh, system, working with Brent Adams at Yale and then at, at Brigham Young. Mark DeGraff, we all know. Ben Britton, we probably all know. David Dingley, uh, we'll see developed some of the very earliest computer assisted indexing schemes, even though it wasn't completely automated, but he was, he stayed very much uh, in the loop and is, and is still active. And uh, Valerie Randall, who wrote a, um, a really nice uh, um, book in which I, I took some, uh, some figures from. So the outline, let's see, am I, okay, here we go. So the outline for today, so I wanna talk about some, a little bit about EBSD technology um, and the development of EBSD and talk about uh, human indexing and coochie patterns and how we move from that to automated indexing and really the application and the rise of uh, the Huff transform, right? So these are words probably I'm guessing that most people who use EBSD have heard, the Huff transform, right? It's it's in the team software. It's a little window that pops up. Okay. But who actually knows what the Huff transform is? Just a show of hands of people who use EBSD, right? How many people could feel that if they had a Kikuchi pattern in front of them, could actually index it back to an orientation? Okay. We got one, <laughs> one, one person in the room, right? So it's actually not all that hard, but most users don't really know or appreciate. Then it's, if I have that data, how do I go from that to uh, things like um, uh, micro, uh, micro texture and orientation correlation? So how do, I, how do I compute orientation distribution functions and pole figures, right? And I want to put that in a historical perspective because a lot of the technology that we use or the calculations that we use to do that are kind of historical accidents left over from pole figure analysis from x-ray diffraction. And we're not, are, in my mind, are not necessarily particularly suited to the data for EBSD, but we kludge them together into systems that work. Um, 
I want to just very briefly hit on some recent advances. I'm going to spend like a minute or two on each of these. So I'm not going to, uh, you know, dive into uh, the details. And then at the end, um, just talk about what I think are the important um, uh, open questions, right? So we, how do I, there we are, okay. So how do, where do we start, right? So uh, back in 1928, um, Kikuchi uh, did this experiment where essentially he shot uh, cathode ray uh, tubes, a, dis a gas discharge beam of 60 keV directed onto a cleavage face of, of calcite at a very low angle, grazing angle. And he was uh, very surprised when lines showed up. He called them in the paper, they're called uh, remarkable. Um, around the same time, other people started doing experiments and they started calling these patterns, of course, they weren't called Kikuchi patterns at the time because who names something like that after themselves. Uh, they were called P patterns or patterns of the fourth kind. And I have never found any explanation of where that name comes from. So if anyone knows, if anyone comes across a reason why they would be called that, um, uh, please let me know. Um, so this is really, the only time I'm gonna get heavy into the physics here, um, and I'm not even really getting heavy into the physics, but just it's just kind of uh, maybe a little important to understand when we're talking about uh, uh, EBSD, we really have you know, our incident uh, beam, and then we have diffuse scattering within our sample, right? And these samples are gonna scatter over a series of wave vectors. They are not really losing any energy, right? There's a small amount of energy loss, right? But what this basically means is that every plane in our sample is guaranteed to have electrons traveling at the Bragg angle and will get diffracted, right? And they're going to uh, uh, diffract out, right? And the since the... Uh, Diffraction angle is essentially twice the Bragg angle. That means the, the width of the band is going to be directly related to the despacing, right? It's going to be the despacing magnified by the distance from, uh, from the detector, right? And we can, you know, now we get diffraction patterns that look like this, where we see all of the bands, we see all of our, uh, intersections, right? We intersect at our um, uh, at our zone axes. And now the goal here is to go from this to an actual orientation and this to, to texture information. So progress uh, kind of crept along, right? So it wasn't too, far, too long after Kikuchi that people started doing uh, uh, wide angle Kikuchi band measurements. You can tell that these are done on a curved uh, photographic plate because the bands form these uh, nice sinusoidal um, uh, sin uh, sinusoid. The first time people have actually ever indexed the Kikuchi pattern uh, was in 1954. This was again a cylindrical detector with the sample and the, the uh, electron beam coming in, right? And this was 1954. This was about 10 years prior to the invention of the first commercial SEM system, right? The, the stereo scan microscope from Cambridge. Um, and we see a lot of important things on here. So we see that we don't have uniform contrast across our um, film. So that means there's a directionality to the scattering, right? We've got a sample that's tilted. We're far more likely to scatter in a forward direction, right, than, uh, than back. But we can also, um, 
go through and identify which bands belong to which plane and we can identify our zone axes. And this was the first time that we've actually this was the, actually used this to identify uh, the lattice orientation in in a crystal. Of course, people in TEM did this. You know, here's this is uh, a Kikuchi map of FCC crystal when I of FCC when I first joined um, Ohio State. We still had one SEM that or one TEM that had film camera capabilities. I forget which one it was, Brian, you might probably remember. The uh, CM200. Maybe, yeah, it must have been it. So I, I asked Hank to make me one of these and he very politely told me where to shove it. <laughs> um, but I always thought this was really cool because in my mind, this just is, was the first kind of visualization I ever saw of, of how you could actually get orientation, right? So you could look and see which, which zone is pointing up at you, right? And that tells you what plane normal you have. And then you can look at the angle in your, your image to the other poles relative to, you know, some kind of uh, macroscopic axis. And that tells you the rotation about it. So, you know, an image like this was the first, um, uh, first way, at least that I was that that became really clear to me how we can get um, orientation information. So up until here we are at the 1970s, now we have people doing things like hand drawing out the full stereographic uh, projection of Kikuchi bands. Um, this is looking at defects in single crystal silicon. Right, but you can imagine the amount of time, right? It says here, this was constructed with a beam compass and a drafting pen on a wolf net, right? So, you know, this was actually a sizable chunk of someone's uh, master's thesis was making these, uh, these images so that they could index uh, patterns when, when they saw them. Okay. So now we get into the SEM, the first, the very first SEM application uh, for Kikuchi patterns, then it rolls in Harland. They, uh, this paper that came out in Filmag in 1973, they described a, um, uh, a camera that went into the SEM to be able to uh, capture Kikuchi patterns. They also introduced the term elect electron backscatter diffraction patterns. They used the term EBSP, right? And if we look, you can see what, what they, this was still on film, right? But you can see it looks very similar to the types of data that we collect on an EBSD camera, right? Instead of being a, a digital camera, it's film. And notice uh, the time scale here, the exposure time starts at one second and goes up to a thousand seconds, right? And so the probe current here, they were saying this was a 50 nanoamp probe current and a 15 second exposure to capture to do the, uh, to do the um, uh, focusing, they said you needed a hundred seconds minimum exposure right so it became yes it is now a herculean effort but we do have uh backscatter diffraction patterns um in the sem so david dingley and company in uh 1984 came up with well it says here they developed the, the software in 81 and 82 the first computer indexing of EBSP. So they basically used the same setup. The first one was done on a, uh, they captured it on film and then they put it in front of another camera, which could then be projected onto a computer monitor screen with graphics drawn over it. And you had to uh, pre-mouse, move a cursor to the right spot on the screen type in what the zone axes were. 
So you had to identify uh, which, um, which bands and which zone axes you saw in front of you and where they were. And then the computer would solve and tell you what the orientation of that, of that crystal was, right? Mm -hmm. And in 1987, they got rid of the film step and had a, a, a analog TV camera sitting uh, with a phosphor in front of it, um, staring into it. And, and this is from uh, an account from David Dingley um, for the EBSD meeting in 2016 for the 25th anniversary of, of uh, EBSD. And if you look at it, it really was a, a Herculean effort on the computer side. Right, you know, they talk about the, uh, uh, they have this uh, sit camera. They talk about the different computer scientists and the computer control systems, right? That uh, was a, a custom RS-232 application, right? They wrote this in 1982 in, in BBC Basic, right? Um, so it was this really a, a huge kind of uh, community effort. And he says immediately after the system was demonstrated, they had requests from the National Physics Laboratory in England, uh, uh, Norway, Alcan, Canada, Alcoa, USA, and uh, RISO um, in Denmark, right? So the first demonstration, they, they had people clamoring it. I think it's really interesting that the first two commercial uh, the industry people who wanted a system like this were Alcan and Alcoa. And the reason for that is beer cans, right? Because they wanted to the prob solve the problems with deep drawing uh, of aluminum cans. So not only did that industry fund EBSD, right? It also funded my main research area of crystal plasticity for, for quite a long time because of the waste associated with beer cans. So there's, um, there's a lot of interesting um, connections there. So there were also parallel uh, developments happening at the same time, right? So we had um, uh, SACP or channeling patterns, selected area channeling patterns, sometimes called pseudo Kikuchi, um, where we can look, you know, this, this was being explored as, as an alternative to Kikuchi diffraction in the SEM at the same time. And you can see the challenge with this is we have a, um, here's a stereo, yeah, stereographic triangle stitched together of a bunch of different patterns. So we can see that the angular res resolution isn't as large as, as EBSD, right? But also the uh, spot size was much larger, right? So we had we were on the order of one to ten microns of uh, area that we were getting that you were getting uh, um, information from. But Joe Michael pointed out to me, and I was unaware of this. There actually were a lot of relationships between electron backscatter diffraction and channeling. Right. So if we have come come in flat onto an amorphous sample, we have an an isotropic. Uh, scattering. If we come in at a crystal sample, we have anisotropic uh, scattering just because some directions are going to be much easier. If we tilt, right now we have backscatter. What we can see is that the actual contrast is, is very low, right? The amount of electrons you get from the bright directions and the dark directions are actually, there's not a lot of signal, um, signal difference there. And so you can actually come up with a different kind of physical understanding of how Kikuchi patterns come from, right? And come, thinking of them as really a, uh, a scattering process, right? So what we had before is, you know, we talked about how we, we inelastically scattered followed by diffraction, but you can also think about electrons being channeled out of the sample. Right, which means that we're going to have a reciprocal relationship between the SACP channeling patterns and our Kikuchi patterns. And often um, 
uh, a lot of people in the early days of EBSD were thinking of it more in that way rather than as a true diffraction phenomena like uh, the T, like TEM folks were thinking uh, about Kikuchi patterns. The other technology that was kind of going along at the same time was uh, costal micro diffraction. Typically, this was done in uh, a microprobing um, instrument. So it was used in conjunction with WDS to get both chemistry and orientation. So it sounds a lot like an early version of Teams software, right? Um, where we're coupling e EBSD and EDS, right? Basically, the costal micro diffraction is, is, works basically just the same um, as EDS and WDS, right? You come down, you set up your, you get uh, x-rays generated uh, from both characteristic x-rays and breaking Bremsstrahlung from the interaction of the electron beam with the sample, right? And we get our costal cones of x-ray that, that come out. And you had a uh, very good spatial resolution. Well, depending, right? <laughs> still large compared to EBSD, but you had um, a very accurate lattice spacing measurement and you had uh, a better depth resolution often than with, um, with EBSD. So all of these were floating around at the same time. Finally, in 1992, two things sort of came about. First is that, uh, um, computers finally got fast enough to do the calculations needed for EBSD and camera technology got, became fast enough, right? When you were spending 15 seconds with a sit camera to get a single, a single, you know, kind of image, um, the automation didn't really help you very much, right? But if you get cameras that are sensitive enough Right now, you can um, uh, think about automating this, and this is again uh, the words here from David Dingley, and it talks about how he had a conversation with with um, Brent Adams um, uh, at the ICOTOM meeting in 1988. Uh, Adams then went on; he was at at Yale, he assembled a team. Stuart Wright was a undergraduate at the time. Um, and he had some, a small amount of funding from the National Science Foundation. And he says the total amount of money for the first EBSD system totaled less than $50,000 in funds. The rest of it was just kind of cobbled, uh, cobbled together. Um, Stuart, did not actually use the Huff transform approach that that um, in in the 1992 paper he used actually something very similar to Mark DeGraff's dictionary indexing. He did pattern. He had theoretical patterns and then and uh, matched. So again, everything old is new again. Um, in his, the later papers and thesis, he adopted a different edge finding algorithm. The Huff transform came in a a, a little bit later, but the first commercial systems. Uh, did did use that. What I think is really interesting, so here we, this is actually the first ever recorded orientation micrograph, the first EBSD scan. It was on 40% compressed aluminum. Um, and if we notice the first papers on EBSD that explains how this was done, only has 326 citations, despite essentially being completely groundbreaking uh, and issuing, in my mind, completely revolutionizing revolutionizing how we consider orientations. Uh, Stewart's thesis only has 29 citations. Two of those are from me, um, right? So the take home here is that we do a really bad job in our community of citing foundational sources, right? <laughs> right, everyone cites review papers that were written many years after these as as the primary reference for EBSD. No one ever goes back to the uh, um, the true source, right? So how do we do this indexing, right? So first we just have to 
do a quick brief refresher. I'm sure everyone kind of is aware of uh, the geometry here, right? But we've got a sample tilted at 70 degrees, right? Or 20 degrees off the beam. Um, we strike down, we get our patterns on our detector. I think the really useful visualization is to think of an entire diffraction sphere around your sample, right? And you can scale that sphere, sphere out until it is tangent to our detector at exactly one point. That point of tangency is what's known as the pattern center or the closest uh, orthogonal distance from the detector to, uh, um, to where the beam intersects uh, our sample. And essentially what we have here is a, a a uh, genomic projection onto our detector. So great circles on our diffraction sphere become straight lines on our diffraction pattern, approximately, right? We also have to just refresh ourselves on what we mean by uh, orientations, right? And we can define the most useful I could give like a whole, like definitely a whole hour lecture on just this one slide, how we define an orientation. Um, but we can just think of it as a, re, uh, a relationship in the form of a rotation or a coordinate transformation between a sample coordinate frame and a crystallographic coordinate frame, right? And there's many different ways of defining this. There are many conventions for orientations as there are people working on them. If you want to focus discussion on just the conventions related to EBSD, see Ben's excellent paper from 2016. Um, but we can describe a rotation as a rotation matrix, a coordinate transformation, boiler angles. We have at least four different uh, conventions for Euler angles. Most common is is Bunga, but we also have Rho, Canova, and Cox Euler angles that different people use. We can do angle axis pairs. We could do Rodriguez vectors. We could do quaternions. We could do yaw, pitch, and roll. We could do latitude, longitude, rotation, right? And the list goes on. Essentially, any, any set of three numbers you can come up with, you can use to describe uh, um, an orientation. Right, But if we just think of it as a mapping between either the sample to the crystal or the crystal to the sample, depending on which EBSD software you use, um, you, right, that's what we're going to define as our orientation. So how do we go from a pattern to an orientation? If we start by assuming that we have a pattern where we have labeled bands, right? So if we have one of those David Dingley systems, we've labeled our, our uh, uh, zone axes. We can basically take a look at vectors that go from our beam position on the sample to two points on a given band, right? We need, we need at least two bands to be able to do this, right? And we can define, uh, an orthogonal frame, ref, uh, orthogonal coordinate frame in our in terms of pattern coordinates, right? Because if I take these two vectors, right, O Q and O P, right, they make a triangle with point O. If I take the cross product of these, I get a vector that is orthogonal to both of them, which means it's going to lie in the plane of the detector, right? So then I have two detectors that are in the plane. I can create a coordinate frame. I just take one as my one axis, my dot product, right? I can then do the dot product of the two vectors that lie in the plane to get one that's orthogonal to the other, right? And then I can do a dot product of my two coordinate axes to get my third direction. Right, so that's not too hard. I can do the same thing with respect to crystal coordinates, 
right? And my sample, I already have my frame defined. It's my R, D, T, D, and N, D, or my X, Y, and Z microscopy frame, right? So if my sample is actually tilted at 70 degrees, right, or not, or 20 degrees from the beam, it's pretty easy to do. So I can calculate my direction cosines between my pattern and my sample and these two different crystal uh, uh, axes, this ends up being diagonal. Then I can just do a con tensor contraction of these two rotation matrices to get my crystal orientation. So a little bit of linear algebra and geometry, but it's not too bad, right? We can, if I know a couple poles, I can easily get my orientation. Now, how do I go from pattern? How do I do this completely automated, right? If I have an EBSD pattern, how do I find my bands and my poles in that image so I can do that fairly simple calculation? And that's where most people go, black magic. Okay, got it, right? Um, in reality, it's also not that hard. We have something here. Uh, the Huff transform. The, the nice thing about Huff transform, the, the Huff transform was developed in the, the 60s for other, um, uh, other applications, but each point in our image maps to a curve in Huff space, right? It, right, if I put in X and Y, as the values of my point, I now have this rho theta, right? And this is a function, right? I now have this rho value as a function of theta, right? And that gives me a curve, right? Every point in Huff space matches to a line back into real space, right? So I can take any point in here, put in rho theta, and now I'm left with this uh, equation of a line, right? The nice thing, and the part that makes this all work, the curves in Huff space for all points that come from the same line in real space all intersect at one and only one spot in this Huff, Huff space. So we can find the intersection. We can find the intersection point here. We know where our bands, are, our lines are in our image. Right, and so that is uh, the magic of of uh, the Huff transform. Right, it's used in a lot of other areas where I need to find lines that are disconnected. Right, so if I'm I have a uh, early autonomous vehicle and I need to be able to stay within a line, right, I can't just do an edge detection because my lane my dashed lines are all broken up. Right, but Huff transform lets me find uh, all the straight lines in the image, even if they're not, they're not continuous. Um, uh, way back, I did uh, a paper that I'm actually really, really proud of. I'm generalizing the Huff transform. Um, I called these phase-coded phase generalized Huff transforms to be able to find features that were not just lines, but any arbitrary shape, either 2D or 3D. Um, and also to encode, make them a complex uh, filter so that you can uh, encode lines and other features based on the orientation, right? And I used these for um, identifying seg uh, automatic segmentation of colony microstructures for, for alpha, beta, titanium. I published this in a journal that no one ever heard of and went out of business because my PhD advisor was the editor in chief. And uh, so while I'm really, really proud of this paper, no one on the planet knows it exists, um, right? So identifying our peak in Huff space, right? This is the map you get from uh, team software. So this is what the Huff filter looks like. Uh, and in fact, this is not exactly a pure Huff. This is more of a uh, a radon transform where you weight the lines based on the intensity of the pixel 
in the image, right? So you don't just make all, all uniform lines. And what that does is that gives you this characteristic dark light dark uh, spots in, in terms of the, uh, the Huff transform. And that's because our EBSD band profile uh, looks is, is not, uh, well, it's symmetric, but well, close to symmetric, but because I have a dark region right around my, the light spot on my, on my band. So to identify the spots, we just do a convolution with, with what's called a butterfly mask. You can think of these spots as being looking like butterflies with dark wings and a white body. And so if we convolve with the filter that has that same profile, we automatically pop out the brightest bands in our diffraction pattern, right? So now, okay, this is starting to make sense, right? Now I know where my bands are in my image, but how on earth do I figure out which bands are which, right? Now I need to label them, right? And democracy in action, right? Stuart Wright gets major kudos for coming up with this because this is such a simple idea that is so powerful and so robust. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. So essentially what he did was let's make a table. All of the bands that we're likely to see, so here we are in face centered cubic, I can say, okay, I got my 200 and my 311, and the angle between those is 25.2. Just make an exhaustive table of the angle between all of my planes, right? The nice thing about this is those are invariant to the actual orientation. This table is never going to change based on how my crystal is oriented, right? Then I'm gonna break all of the bands that I've identified and I'm gonna break them into triplets, A, B, and C, right, for the first one. So I'm gonna look at this band, this band, and this band. I then look at all the possible combinations between those triplets. I look at the angle between A and B, A and C, and B and C. And I go to my lookup table and try and find uh, consistent planes that have those angles, right? So for A and B, I might say, well, that's not quite 45, let's call that 35 something, right? So maybe this is 311 and 311 type, or maybe 111 and 220, right? And then I go, okay, A and C, right? What does, what does that look like? A and C is here, that's a bit smaller. So maybe that's this 29.5, so. 111 and 311. Oh, okay, that's consistent with the, the 311 and 111. So that's my guess. Then we double check B and C, right? And we just go through. And then we go, so we, we label A, we label B, we label C. Then we pick every other triplet. And we say, are these other triplets consistent with the guess I made for the first one? And if they are, it gets a vote. If it isn't, it, it doesn't get a vote, right? And we go through all possible, every possible guess that we find on the table for A, B, and C, or others, right? You can see these ones down here. And we just put it in, which one is consistent? And then at the end, we sum them all up. And the one with the best correct corresponding solution, we call, we label those poles, right? Once we have those poles labeled, we go through that really nice linear algebra routine to calculate what the, what the orientation is. And all of this gets done now 10,000 times a second in the EVSD software, right? But this voting scheme, this Huff scheme is essentially unchanged from the very first EBSD systems to now. This is still the default way that we do this. We have measures of goodness of uh, uh, fit 
right? The most one that we use the most is confidence index, right? And what we do is we take the, the top, the solution with the top number of votes, subtract out the, the solution with the second most number of votes, divide that by all possible combinations we, we've tried. So our solution on the previous slide, because some other ones had a reasonable number of votes, right? This actually is a fairly low confident index. This is only 0.45, right? But you can see how if we average the number of correct uh, uh, indices that we get, we can see that it starts to drop off pretty drastically over 0.1, right? So basically anything over 0.1 means I have a very high probability of that being a correct, uh, a correct index. The other, which people don't look at and probably should because it tells you a lot about whether you have a good system calibration is your fit parameter, right? Which gives you an average angular deviation from our detected bands to bands that are calculated, uh, calculated from our solution, right? So we can see, you know, a solution with a good fit versus a poor fit, right? And all of this is right out of the team software manual. It's only 659 pages. Everyone should read it. It's a lot of a lot of good stuff in there. Okay. So after seeing this, everyone now goes, oh, that's it. That's not that hard. <laughs> right. It really isn't. There isn't a whole, whole lot to it. Um, ben Britton wrote a uh, has a really nice YouTube video explaining this actually in more detail. And um, uh, he also has his Astro EBSD software that you can that you can look at it. So now we have patterns, index patterns. Um, I wanna move on to texture. I'm gonna go a little, little faster through this, right? But so texture is the way that we quantify preferred crystallographic orientation, right? Our classic X-ray macro texture tells us what volume fraction of a sample falls within some delta of a particular orientation. Uh, Bunga, um, his papers in German are written in the most scientific German. So even if you don't speak German, you can generally still understand them, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but he basically says the orientation distribution or texture of a polycrystal is characterized through the volume fraction of const constituting crystals with orientations lying between D and GG, right? So it's just how much you have What's interesting is that the first use of texture in this context, both from the word and the concept, comes from 1833, a textbook from a Belgian geologist. I have to take uh, Rudy Venk's word for this because I don't speak French and I definitely couldn't read a textbook in, in French from 1833. Uh, but What's interesting is he's talking about preferential crystal orientation 80 years before Bragg's law, right? So the mathematical theory of crystals was developed well before our physical, right? Before we actually started uh, uh, characterizing them, right? So people could talk about rocks where you see, actually see physical alignment of crystal faces. Um, and people related those things to property. This is just the mathematics. Um, so the orientation distribution function is our probability distribution. I've taken a couple slides here from Tony Rollett's really, really good uh, class notes. If anyone wants to learn about texture and anisotropy, right, should definitely take uh, a look at these, at least until the department lets me teach a course in this area, which I've been asking for for a while. But um, right, but uh, Tony Rollick has really excellent notes, and um, I'm embarrassed to say how many times I actually refer back to them myself when <laughs> when when doing things. So just a wealth of information, right? So we have to look really quickly at one particular way of representing orientations because this is not only the, the representation that uh, 
EBSD systems use. It's the, the framework that we've built all of our texture calculations around. And those are our Euler angles, Cox, uh, Fred Cox uh, used a really interesting analogy and he described the Euler angles. Basically his starting point was uh, a ship on a globe, right? We have latitude, longitude, and then we need to know what's the heading of the ship on that surface, right? Um, we, for historical reasons, uh, use the Bunga Euler angles, which is a, uh, a set of three rotations that we use to rotate a crystal uh, sample axis onto a crystal axis. They are most unfortunately labeled as phi one, phi, and phi two. Why Bunga chose that, I have no idea. He doesn't describe that in his book. It's just, here's what I did. Um, right, so we can look at uh, these are animated. First, we rotate around uh, our Z sample axis. Oh, I forgot these have this annoying or, uh, animation in there, sorry. Right, then we rotate around the new, our new uh, E1 axes, and then we can rotate around our new E3. So the Bunga angles are what are known as Z, X, Z Euler angles. And we're always rotating around the new um, uh, each time, right? The other thing we need to consider is our area element or our volume element, right? And that a given change in latitude and longitude and rotation does not sweep out equal areas on the surface of the globe when I'm near the North Pole versus when you're near the equator. Right, so that means we need this invariant measure or a different or, or har measure of our orientation space, right? Sine, sine phi, d phi, d phi one, d phi two, right? And this causes us no end of problems because that means our orientations are not uniformly distributed in this space when we have an actual uniform distribution of orientations in our sample. We have a sample that has perfectly random with no preferential texture, and we, we plot this into Euler space. We have very, far fewer counts as phi approaches zero than when phi approaches 90, right? The binning in our, in our orientation space is not equal, even when we have a equal texture. This is why we plot texture plots as multiples of the uniform random distribution. We normalize by this to take this, this effect out, right? ODFs in terms of Euler space, we usually plot them as sections. Even though we can now make 3D plots, no one does. We still look at these in sections. I don't know why, right? Um, Often, well, we can sort of skip that to for, for time, right? So historically, texture measurement came from X-ray diffraction, right? And the problem there was inverting the pole figure, right? We have several incompletely measured X-ray pole figures, and we're trying to get back our complete orientation distribution from that. So the problem there is how do I get a complete distribution from partially measured marginal probability distributions, right? And um, Bunga developed a, a method based on a spherical harmonic or Fourier series expansion, right? Where we write our orientation distribution function as uh, a, a, a Fourier series, this is our spherical harmonic basis. These are our coefficients. We can also write our pole figures as a, a different harmonic basis with coefficients, right? And then we have our grand problem of inverting the pole figure, right? Which is I can now write my pole figure coefficients as a sum or an integral 
over my uh, ODF coefficients, right? And if I have enough pole figures, I can invert this. And the nice thing is the number of coefficients I need for symmetry scales. Bunga does some symmetrization stuff. The problem here is because if our crystal centrosymmetric, we have our pole figure has an inversion symmetry. So we only have half of the number of 4A coefficients. All the odd ones go to zero because of that symmetry of our pole figure, which is not a symmetry of our ODF. So that means we get ghosts and errors. Okay. So there was a huge uh, source of debate in the texture community about if this was the right way to do it. Why is this relevant to EBSD? Because Bunga and Brent Adams were good friends. Stuart Wright spent time in Germany with, with Bunga and had his uh, code to do this. So when EBSD came around, we adopted the machinery and the language of Bunga's generalized spherical harmonics. Was it a hammer looking for a nail or uh, uh, because direct methods ran into this problem of an, in, a, a difficult binning in terms of the, uh, the orientation space? Different people have different answers. Stewart says it was because he had code and didn't want to write something else. Right, so I'm going to stick with uh, with that one. So, how do we use spherical harmonics to get our ODFs for EBSD? Well, first we def we define a smoothing kernel, right? In this case, this is a Gaussian-like kernel that's going to decay uh, as we move away uh, in the angular space. We're going to perform uh, kernel density estimation and. Uh, we can write that kernel density estimation with respect to the Fourier coefficients, and we get something that is looks good here. I can take my orientation that I measure from EVSD, plug it into my Fourier basis, multiply it by this nonsense, which depends on my L, my bandwidth, and then uh, sum them all together. And that's what gives me my ODF. So I, that's how I go from discrete points in Euler space to a complete uh, uh, orientation distribution, right? Um, I sort of want to, I'm going to skip all of the math here, but with uh, harmonic analysis, we can do a whole bunch of other things. We can look at misorientation, dis misorientation distributions both uncorrelated and spatially correlated. Um, I did a lot of work with orientation correlation functions, right, which you can find there, right? Just an example here, I've got two orientations, cube and Gauss, and we can look at what the or orientation correlation looks like. Heavily deformed tantalum, we can again calculate and look at how our, the, what the spatial statistics of our orientation look like. Why am I telling you this? Because, the first applied paper using OIM. This is so. This is the second EBSD paper ever. The first one describes the method. The second one describes the application. Was all about measuring orientation correlations in polycrystal metals, and Stuart Wright did it because Brent was a mechanics guy. He wasn't a microscopist. He really wanted to link crystal plasticity with composite theories through. Uh, uh, series expansions that involved these, these microstructure cor correlation functions. That was his entire motive for inventing EBSD. And since this paper, no one has ever <laughs> done this, this again, because they realized it was really hard. So Stewart's the second paper that just talks about orientation correlations from EBSD and, uh, um, making making plots like this. So I think this is, is really interesting that the motivation for inventing something is often not the use that the community finds for your tools, right? Um, so I'm just gonna skip the stuff on dictionary indexing and spherical indexing and the, right? Um, because I just wanna wrap up with a couple kind of thoughts. Is there a better way to estimate the ODF from discrete samples, right? 
how do we do things like hypothesis testing and uncertainty quantification with the harmonic framework that we have? Right now, there really is not a good answer. And I've been working with people and colleagues in statistics, and they're all like, eh, I don't know. we need to do a different, we need to come up with a different method of, of describing the ODF rather than the spherical, the spherical harmonics. So for a while, I was playing with the Bingham distribution. This is the exact analog to the Gaussian distribution for orientations. And I said, Gaussian mixture models are pretty powerful. Maybe we can do a Bingham mixture model to describe textures. So we came up with a way of fitting and it worked really well. In this first paper, we didn't have any symmetry because symmetrization was hard. Then I collaborated and we came up with a symmetrized form of this Bingham distribution and we were all excited. And then we tried it and damn it, it doesn't work for real textures. Turns out textures that we're actually interested in cannot be written as mixture models um, uh, over this Bingham distribution. So just some thoughts and open area, areas that I really want to get at, but I don't have the, the mechanics right now too, is how do we put error bars on texture, right? Can we describe the uncertainty in our ODF or pole figure measurements that's conditional on the data that was used to generate it? And how do we do hypothesis testing uh, for texture, right? If I have two ODFs from two samples characterized on two different EDSD systems, how do we determine if our measured ODFs actually match? How do we compare model and simulation? How do we tell st in a statistically rigorous way if our texture is truly random or if there's some underlying weak texture? Right now, all we have is the eyeball test. Right, and so here's uh, this, you know, an example. Right, here's a uh, a measured texture, right, for two pole figures. Here's a simulated one. Do these match? Right? Can I put a confidence? Right? Are they the same texture? Yes or no? Who knows how to answer that? Right now, no one. Right, and I think that's a really uh, a really big problem. Um, Last thought, it's just amazing that EDSD is so robust and user-friendly. Most people don't actually ever have to think about what the system is actually doing, right? Um, there's just still a lot of room for development outside of the hardware. What can we do if we really engage the mathematics, statistical, and signal processing communities? We have not done a good job of that. Um, and then, of course, not, let's not forget machine learning and AI, which could have been a whole other thing that I didn't, <laughs> didn't get into. So thanks. Um, there's still a couple minutes uh, for questions. I'm sorry I ran a little bit, bit long there, but the first draft of this was 150 slides. So I really, <laughs> I really condensed it down. There's a lot more historical, uh, interesting things that um, I'd love to put in there. So uh, questions from anybody, either here or online? I didn't quite understand the difference between the causal micro diffraction pattern versus a normal Gucci pattern. Oh, so the causal, the micro diffraction, you come down and you're actually getting x ray. Okay. Uh, right. So you, the same as with EDS or WDS, right? You're, you're getting uh, both characteristic x rays of your material and uh, Bremsstrahlung x rays, right? That are then diffracted, diffracted out. For costal micro diffraction to work well, you need uh, a material where its own characteristic X-rays diffract well at its lattice spacing, right? Which means that some things are going to be excluded because of that, because of that constraint, right? Which is, in my mind, is probably the main reason why, why that technology kind of didn't take off, whereas EDSD did. I have a question. Uh, can you go back a couple of slides where you're talking about the Comparison, yeah, right. Yeah, there. yeah. So you talk about the comparison of different texture plots and simulated versus real, and so is your estimation that it's how we're actually quantifying the texture, or I mean, there's limits in the actual spatial resolution of the collection, the sample prep, and all that. So, yep. what is the, if you will, rate limiting step in terms of 
if we have bad data, even if we have a robust way of quantifying it or, or vice versa. Right now, right. right now, I think the most important step is I don't have a way of determining how good my measurement, my my texture is, my texture measurement is, given the 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 actual data that I've measured, right? So I don't have kind of error bars. I don't know what the accuracy of my individual measurements are, right? How does dropped, right? How does what happens if I do a cleanup and I drop out all the points that are less than than ten percent? What is the likely effect of that on my thing? Am I pulling out? small grains is that real data right right now this is all user intuitive i have no way of but you're saying so like the accuracy but wouldn't you need almost like a ground truth to say if we know this is the correct solution then i mean how do you know well but lots of other statistical problems we don't have a ground truth okay right we can look at variance in measurements right we can okay. look at relative variance between two different experiments that are supposedly measuring the same thing Right, okay. you know, if we look at all of you know the all of our particle measurements, mm -hmm. right? We have standard, you know, we we have we can develop confidence measures as to did we actually see that particle mm -hmm. or is that a phantom mm -hmm. signal? Mm -hmm. Right, we can't do that right now okay. with with EBSD data. Yeah. Um, so you at the very end commented on like machine learning sort of things. Yeah. And I guess the Zach's like kind of following off, off on this. I guess in theory you could right make some like simulation of okay this is the texture sort of the very perfect case in the simulation um, and make like a dictionary if you will and then could you use machine learning or is this like a thing where you could train it to tell you like how true your texture is, or it gets sort of this uncertainty um, from sort of a machine learning type device? Um, so some, uh, so there is work going on with using machine learning for indexing. No one is going beyond that with respect to, um, with respect to the machine learning side of things. Right. There's in the mechanics field itself, machine learning has essentially replaced some classical uncertainty quantification techniques for some types of simulations and experiments. Um, so I think there is potentially an opportunity there, but it requires, I think that's kind of a high hurdle because. That requires experts in microscopy, machine learning, and AI to work together, right? So, seems like uh, Steve needs to go to a PhD student kind of problem. Maybe right. it would need more than more one, than and I think it would need more money than anyone would be willing to give me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Steve, sorry, yeah. I have one more question on kind of work. Yeah. So. So are you so you're saying there's still, I guess, a disconnect and just saying, well, we have good data because there's ways of quantifying the, the data itself, the Kikuchi patterns is high quality, yeah. but the but still the texture analysis might not be high quality, or yeah, that, that's not enough, I guess, to say we have good data, thus the analysis. Yeah. So you're saying there's a di disconnect so in the analysis. There's yeah. a disconnect in the analysis, right? And, and so if you think about how would you determine if how would you decide if a texture if a sample is random tech or randomly textured, mm -hmm. right? I have a couple thousand grains, right? So over the orientation space, that's a pretty sparse sampling. So all of my little bins only get, you know, I don't don't put points in all of them, mm -hmm. right? So I calculate an ODF from that and it varies depending on which time I measure it, a max intensity of one and a half times random to 2.2 times random or something like mm -hmm. that. Is that actually random or is that something that has a weak preferential texture where some grains are actually showing up mm -hmm. at twice the, the amount? Right now, it's just the eyeball test. And if it's less than two, we say, eh, it's close to random. Yeah, no, that makes that, yeah. I, I want a confidence index. I want yeah. to say with, I, I want, how many points do I need to measure to get a 
95% confidence in the interval on my statement, this is a truly random, uniform random texture. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. What is the perspective on the one hand of the companies that make the software for Tesco and also the industrial companies? Can you talk about that problem to them? What's their reaction? Yeah, actually, so that's a really good point. And I took out slides on this because if you look at the parameters that are set for uh, the default parameters in the microscope for calculating this texture, right? They were decided a long time ago to try and make the uh, EBSD data from a couple hundred grains match that from pole figure diffraction experiments where you're integrating millions over millions of grains, right? And so that was basically set that we want a bandwidth of 16, L equals 16, and a half width of 10 degrees. That is still the default for all EBSD systems, even though we can now measure hundreds of thousands of grains without too much difficulty. And the reason why it doesn't change is because when TSL tried to do that, when they introduced their second gen cameras, all their industrial users said, oh, our data is different, right? We can't have that. We needed, we've been measuring samples coming off this line for years now, right? Now, all of a sudden, our data looks different. What does that mean, right? So basically <laughs> the defaults haven't changed. Right, and most users never change, never change these parameters. And if you measure enough data, right? If I measure, right, they, it converges when I measure, it'll, right, the, the, the meaning of these parameters kind of gets washed away when I have enough, enough measurements, right? Sort of hand wavy, right? That it, it, it all works out okay. But there are actual people looked at really rigorous ways of deciding how do I set my bandwidth and my uh, um, half width, right? MTech, Ralph and MTech has a nice tool, right? And what luckily what Ralph did was he hid it from the users. And if you don't tell it a kernel, it estimates it for you and gives you the best kernel given the data that, that you have for it. But in the OEM softwares, it's all still just the default, the default setting. You can change it easily, but most users almost never do. One quick question, because you just mentioned MTech. Um, do you have a preferred analysis like method or pack, software packet that you prefer for EBSD? Like I, I use MTech for everything, okay. simply because um, familiarity and being able to monkey with everything, right? And being able to see the source code and see what it's actually doing, right? Um, and so, um, you know, I've written some things for MTech, I, you know, some of the Bingham stuff um, I've, you know, kind of updated um, and is in like, beta versions of mtech that are not like actually kind of in release but you can get them get the code of things like that from ralph of things i've done and so i i, I just use mtech simply because i'm familiar with it right but you can do really good analysis with all with oem software right you just have to know it and be willing to you know, move beyond the default settings. So, someone just asked you: Are you routine, routinely collecting your own patterns? Yes. Yeah. You. Uh, well. Okay. So I am not anymore. Right. The last time I sat in front of a microscope was probably like 2016 or something. Um, but I routinely use uh, data that was collected. I would also encourage everyone storage is cheap. You should be saving all of your patterns, 
right? Before the, the default is you do the Huff transform, you throw away your actual diffraction pattern, right? We should be, as a rule, saving all of our raw data so that we can go back and look at, right, at the raw, right? If you, if you decide, um, you know, changes in, in your, your collection, changes in your, um, your, your Huff setting, changes in, you know, right? These can have effects, right? And if you don't save the pattern, then it's, you don't know, right? Saving the pattern also allows you to use the offline tools like dictionary indexing and spherical harmonic indexing and cross-correlation indexing that I skipped over, right? Whereas if you just save the Huff, or well, most people don't even save the Huff data, they just save the orientation data, right? Whereas if you just save the final reduced data set, then that's it. There's nothing more you could ever do with that data. So why limit yourself? We have one more question, but I'm going to send it to you to answer offline, if you will, Steve. Yeah. We're, we're 10 minutes over. Oh, geez. I'm sorry. Don't, don't apologize. Thank you. <laughs> All right. so. Thanks for spending your lunchtime with me. I hope it was enjoyable. <laughs>